good afternoon to you all. Um, thank you for coming today. Um, this is now the second session of the uh, seminar in circulation um, and trans translocal and network uh, studies um, in modernism. Um, and uh, um, a session devoted especially to um, to periodical studies, to the study of uh, modernist magazines and the role, the mediating role, the role uh, that some modernists play in the mediation, um, cultural mediation uh, between different modernist traditions. Um, I took the opportunity that we had a colleague uh, coming uh, as visiting um, uh, researcher, visiting scholar, uh, for a one week residency here at SEJ uh, to uh, invite her, uh, given that she has uh, done consistent work in Italian modernist studies, uh, including in, uh, work on periodical, uh, Italian periodicals. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and is currently uh, preparing uh, some uh, new research. Uh, in, the, in the field of uh, Italian uh, studies and cultural mediation in the uh, Italian context. I thought this was uh, a perfect uh, time to, uh, to invite you to speak to us uh, in, about these matters. So I will, without uh, uh, further ado, introduce uh, Katy Pitti. I brought a lot of notes on the laptop because just the, 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 there's no point in printing too much paper, so bear with me. Uh, Katia Pizzi uh, is senior lecturer in Italian studies uh, at the Institute of Modern Languages Research uh, uh, at the School of Advanced Studies uh, uh, at the University of London, uh, where she is, has been since 2009, uh, the director of the Center for the Study of Cultural Memory uh, um, for the Institute of uh, Modern Languages Research. Um, where she also and she also acts as um, editor uh, to the Peter Lang Cultural Memory series, uh, uh, which uh, she has uh, overseen for some time. Katia has published five books, uh, in, uh, six, six, a number of substantial number of articles and chapters in the UK and overseas on modern Italian literature and culture, um, including uh, uh, the culture and literature of um, um, contact zones, Italian futurism, uh, popular culture, uh, children's literature and illustration. In fact, very recently she edited uh, a, a, a book called, um, with the title Pinocchio, Puppets and Modernity with uh, Routledge in 2012, which um, won a, a prize um, and has also uh, done some uh, work, uh, editorial work on uh, about cities, or Cold War cities. Um, the history, culture, and memory of Cold War cities, um, co edited with Hiatala uh, uh, for Peter Lang in 2016. Uh, her monograph, Italian Futurism and the Machine, is in, currently in the press, uh, due to be out uh, in the Revenge to English the Press, forthcoming this coming June. Uh, and she has very kindly brought some uh, flyers, which I'd ask Antonio to pass around perhaps. Uh, you know, we'll get it to that side this way if you wish. With some more details of the forthcoming uh, book on, uh, on the, the subject of the machine, which having uh, been collaborating in contact with Katia uh, for some time, I know has been a, a subject of her attention for some time. Uh, which she diligently <laughs> has uh, uh, stayed the path despite her many duties at uh, the Institute uh, and, uh, and uh, her many areas of research interest as well. Uh, she is today, I'm very pleased to, to say this, she is today beginning a one week residency uh, as Investigadora Visitante at SEJ, uh, where besides contributing to today's session of the seminar, um, as this seminar on circulation and materiality in new transnational modernist studies, um, a series which started in October and will run until December, 
uh, she will also tomorrow, uh, around this time, in the other room, room one, will be delivering a lecture entitled Transcultural Memories in Trieste to students of two doctoral programs, Discursos, Cultura, História e Sociedade, and Human Rights in Contemporary Societies, which um, <coughs> is open to the whole of uh, SES, the SES student and staff community and to students from Faculdade de Letras. And I'd like to say that, uh, besides that, Katia will be holding meetings with some colleagues um, <coughs> at SES regarding the possibility of uh, uh, collab future collaborations, and she has very kindly also made herself available to meet with students interested in knowing more about the research and training activities of the INLR, Institute of Modern Languages Research at the University of London. Um, and uh, today she will be speaking to us about a very curious figure, uh, the curious figure of Enrico Francolini, and a, a magazine, uh, when focus on a magazine uh, he edited um, in France, I believe, uh, you told me. And other cultural operations, yeah, because okay. the magazine was, as frequently happened in modern, modernism, it's short-lived and, you know, mm. there aren't many issues out there, so I think one of the points of interest is the, the sort of uh, networking activity of this post-war futurist. Um, mm -hmm. But let me first in, um, thank Patricia very much, Patricia Silva and all the colleagues, and here at SES and, uh, and at the university for the invitation. I'm, I'm absolutely delighted now. I'm being very well taken care of, so thank you. Thank Please you very that. much. And uh, I just need to preface this um, with, uh, with three short um, sort of caveats or sort of, um, contextual information. The first one is that uh, what you're about to hear is a sort of splinter. Or it's a subsection of one of the chapters of my book. So it's, uh, it's new research, I haven't presented it uh, anywhere. Although the book has been with me for far too long, you know, longer than I, I would have wanted to, but it's, um, you know, this material has not been presented before. And as you will have gleaned from the flyer, the book is about machines and technology and the, the sort of um, uh, interest of futurismo, of Italian futurism, and particularly post-war futurism in industrial cultures and the cultures of machines and of, uh, and of technology. So what you're about to hear is of course about NOI and cultural operations, but you will see that the machine will come into it uh, quite a bit. Um, the second thing I need to preface the talk with is that um, I'm aware that uh, this seminar series and indeed the work that students are expected to do is uh, or, or that you are expecting to um, work with the students on training and training and what archive work actually means and, and how to sort of navigate archives and modernist archives in this, in this sense. So um, I, I would like to say just a very few words about um, the archive work that is behind this particular piece of research. And um, it's not very recent archive work because it's uh, work that I conducted years back, especially in Rome, in two uh, separate archives. There's um, an archive attached to Università La Sapienza, which is the, the main uh, Roman university, and it's a tiny little archive called Archivio del Novecento in a basement, in a very poorly lit basement room. Uh, in the, in the sort of cellars of the university, and that's where most of the remaining copies of Neu are held. Um, uh, not a sort of terribly friendly archive to work in. I mean, friendly, you know, the staff are very friendly, of course, but the, you know, the logistics and the, 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 the structure is actually a bit difficult to, um, you know, it's difficult to know when it's open, when it's not open, so, you know, the, there are all of these. Um, constraints that come into play as you know students who do archive research will need to, to learn to come to terms with. Um, there's a further archive in Rome attached which is far more approachable and accessible, attached to Macro, which is the um, uh, modern Museum of Modern Art and Contemporary Art in Rome. And they have digitized much of this the their Enrico Brampolini collection, so it's a much more accessible Okay. And of course, part of it is um, held 
very far away in Los Angeles in the John Paul Getty Research Institute uh, where Marinetti's papers are. Now, obviously, this work is on Grampolini, but if you want, a lot of correspondence is held in the Marinetti archive. So, you know, again, issues of accessibility because it's a very remote archive. You need a lot of resources to get there and to, to study there. So, you know, it's, it's part of the, um, part of the um, uh, task of learning how to do scholarship that you have to often sort of branch out and, and visit very remote archives um, where you need you know, a lot of funding to, to access. And the last uh, thing I want to say is that um, I'm trying to follow roughly a chronological, um, uh, chronological order but there are leaps and bounds in the chronology and uh, uh, please stop me if I go on too long because I've sort of taken this to the end of, to the death of Grampolini which was um, in 1956 and there are two experiences that are not related to journals but they are experiences of art clubs, of organisation and, and gathering of artistic communities in Rome but if you find that you know, I'm out of time, or I'm, you know, I'm sort of uh, speaking too much. Please stop me. You know, stop me before I, I go into that. So, all right. Um, so everyone, I think, I hope, is familiar with Filippo Tommaso Marinetti, the founder and leader of Futurismo, who posited the machine and especially the automobile as an emblem of modernity as he emphatically declared in the founding of uh, Futurism, his first manifesto, published in February 1909 in the Parisian daily Le Figaro. And here you have some excerpts from um, the, uh, the manifesto, this founding manifesto that highlight the absolute obsession of Marinetti for the car, the machine, the automobile. Echoing Emile Zola's La Bête Humaine, in particular, and the rarefied poetics of French symbolism, Marinetti's beautiful automobile embodied velocity and simultaneity, as well as sexual encounter and exchange. Here you have uh, Marinetti at the wheel, and um, for all his emphatic and, uh, uh, and absolute uh, obsession with the machine, he wasn't actually a very good driver, we, we know that for sure. As you see on the image to the far uh, right is the famous crash, the car crash of his beautiful Risotto Fraschini, elegant car, uh, uh, which um, he completely crashed and ditched uh, in, while driving um, in 1908, and uh, which is famously described in the founding of Manifesto. Now you see Marinetti at the wheel of another car, this is a sort of mid-1920s photograph, and at the wheel of a tractor in the 1930s, very sort of Mussolini-like, you know, possibly <laughs> posing in Mussolini-like fashion. Uh, but in fact, uh, Marinetti, after this you know, uh, car crash accident, you always used the safe skills of a chauffeur. So he never really drove a car himself any, any, anymore. Marinetti, of course, had honed his approach during the First World War in his first-hand engagements with technologies of war, large and small. Tanks, machine guns, uh, the wires, the rail tracks, cables and heavy metal industry that traversed the landscape of trench warfare led into fantasies of sexual miscegenation between man and machine. There's a chapter in my book where I discuss this under the figure of the cyborg because Marinette is really interested in these sort of erotic couplings of man and machine. And this is evidenced, for instance, in his novel, The Alcove of Steel, L'Alcova da Chaglio of 1921. Come the 1920s, however, you know, this is pre-war futurism, but come the 1920s, there's a new cohort of futurists, of young futurists who begged to differ. Okay? So after the war, there's a, new, a whole new group of young futurists who um, are really quite far away from Marinetti's take on, um, on, on what futurism was and on the machine in particular. After the war, Italian futurism was left bereft, 
following the death of some of its key exponents, especially Umberto Boccioni, featured here, and Antonio Santelia. Boccioni and Santelia helped shape futurism in the early years, uh, driving experimentalism in painting and sculpture, Boccioni, uh, as was Boccioni's case, and architecture, as was uh, Santelia's case. To borrow from Emily Brown, a new group of Bulgarians were clamoring at the gates. Okay, there's a new group of young futurists. Enrico Prampolini was arguably the leader of this group. There's many others um, who basically dispersed and disbanded themselves across Europe. Ivo Pannacci, uh, Vinicio Paladini, August Czernikoi, etc., etc., to name but a few. These new, young, post-war futurists aim to reposition futurism across new geographical axes, and they aim to pursue international networks and collaborations. And Prampolini was arguably the most transnational artist of the post-war generation. And here you have uh, his figure, uh, his, um, his picture, his portrait here. Born in Modena in 1894, I think like Roberto, Roberto's from Modena, isn't he? Anyway, it's a, it's a tiny city north of Bologna. Rampolini was one of the most convincing Italian futurists working in Europe in the 1920s and 30s. At such a time when several fellow futuristi, Marinetti first and foremost, retrenched into mannerist folds. Um, there's there's a, the sort of old generation uh, De Pero included, to some extent, um, sort of were, were steeped in a sort of line of, in a futurist line that was very, uh, very much the sort of founding, the, fine, the founding line. This new group, this new generation, tried to take futurism out, out, you know, radiating out to the broader European context. Rampolini, through machine art or arte meccanica, developed a brand of futurism that was fully conversant with an emerging global culture. Rampolini's training was in the applied arts. While his intellectual background was steeped in symbolism and data, his practice emerged from within Antonio Giulio Bragaglia's art house, which is an experience uh, chronologically located between 1921 and 1923, and under the auspices of Bregaglia's German and Russian connections. Rampolina had been a disciple of um, Giacomo Balda, who was a sort of on and off, um, uh, on and off futurist, in not sort of exactly part of the futurist um, scene. Um, but I think his international um, his international drive is first honed within the Bragaglia circle, the, circle, the Roman circle, in the early 1920s. Rampolini's creative vein, however, flourished in the post-war years when he expanded his horizons, actively seeking the avant-garde scenes in Prague, Paris and Berlin. While converging with Cercle Carré, the November Gruppe and Ab Abstraction Création, to name but a few, Rampolini retained a clear futurist identity, breathing new life into a splintered and almost defunct futurism. While he may not have been alone in seeking international reputation, the breadth and scope of his connections, his technical and theoretical range, and what Giovanni Lista calls his sustained European vocation were unrivaled. Rampolini exhibited in Paris, in 1921 in London, Manchester and Amsterdam, and in 1922 New York, 1923, Vienna, 1924, Paris, 1925. We're going to come back to this because it's an important experience with the Expo in Paris at this time. New York, 1926, etc. Et now, there's a curious but a quite important seminal um, incident that uh, may well have prompted Campolini's expatriations early on. And I'm, I'm sort of coming back to Boccioni here because um, it appears that Boccioni put a veto on Campolini's, um, on Campolini's uh, uh, joining in the futurist movement. 
early on. Um, and this veto early on in the career actually prompted uh, Prampolini's early expatriations. Now, what happened here? In December 1913, after a, uh, the opening of an exhibition by Bocconi, uh, Prampolini had an altercation with Bocconi, unfortunately. Of course, Bocconi at the time was the uh, undisputed and proprietor leader of the Corporation of Futurist Painters and Sculptors. So his word was, you know, uh, uh, the Bible, you know, could, could be, um, could be um, tested. The discussion that, uh, the altercation that Prampolini and Boccioni had concerned issues of representation of human energy, atmospheric dynamism and synesthesia. And without further ado, without waiting for Boccioni's, uh, uh, for Boccioni's um, approval, Prampolini brought out uh, his first manifesto of futurist architecture entitled L'atmosfera struttura, basi per un'architettura futurista. This initiative absolutely <coughs> enraged Boccioni, who demanded that Prampolini were ousted from futurist circles. A squabble ensued, and Prampolini, to cut a long story short, became persona non grata. He was not to be seen or heard in future circle. So he decided to operate outside the sphere of influence of the intransigent Boccioni. So this may well, you know, this sort of incident may well have been a sort of seminal moment um, that prompted Prampolini to relocate to Paris. Um, back to Prampolini here. So, relocating to Paris um, in these early years, Prampolini worked there on and off for 12 years. Um, there's also an experience in Prague, which I'm going to touch upon uh, in a little while, in the early 1920s. But for about 12 years, Prampolini was mainly based in Paris and acquired a reputation as a French artist, and his name was truncated to the more French sounding Prampo. <laughs> In Paris, Prampolini perfected the Cubist and Surrealist lessons. His career and reputation flourished slowly but steadily in the course of the 1920s. His international acclaim, particularly in the field of theatre, continued to traverse and intersect the international avant-garde in Paris and also in Prague, bouncing back to Italy. And there's really quite a lot that could be said at this stage about Prampolini's engagement with theatre and mechanical theatre. We are here in the early 1920s, it's the season of the mechanical theatres across Europe. Uh, you know, we have the Schlemmers and you know, the Triadisches Ballet and Panagine Palladini's Balletto Meccanico Futurista. So there's a whole big uh, uh, Europe-wide operation in mechanical theatre, but maybe this discussion can be had in another, uh, at another time. But Prampolini's plural activities gathered momentum in the post-war years, placing him at the core of several modernist move movements in Eastern, Western and Central Europe. For example, he exhibited in the first Exposition Dada in Zurich in January 1917 and had his woodcuts reproduced in the journal Dada. Dada connections were a springboard for important international collaborations to follow, for example with Apollinaire, who agreed to edit the French edition of Prampolini's journal Noi, which I'm going to come, come at in a moment. Capital exchanges with active members of the European avant-garde yielded shows in Geneva, in Prague, Berlin and Dusseldorf in concert with local artists. From Geneva, Prampolini proceeded to Prague and Berlin, it's around 1921-1922, where he gradually built up and broadened the range of his collaborations, working with Arp, with Kandinsky and Chagall, and his legacy on Czech art is visible on modernist artists in, in, um, in the Czech Republic, for instance, in Tiger's work. In the realm of what I, in my book, call cultural operations and logistics, because, I mean, I see Prampolini, yes, as a publisher, as, a, as an editor,
but also a real wheeler and dealer, you know, a cultural operator across Europe. Um, Rampolini's activities as publisher and editor took center stage. Interacting constantly with the European avant-garde, Rampolini developed a broad, intricate and rhizomatic network of contacts, publications, committee work, memberships and co-editorships, branching out in all directions, transitioning and mediating across borders, especially after he became reinstated or instated into Futurismo in 1919. Bocconi died in the war in 1916. So in 1919, Rampolini is officially invited to, uh, to join Futurismo. And so he's, he's really, um, this is really the moment where he sort of spreads out and branches out his activities in all these directions. His febrile activities spanned languages, disciplines and styles. Swifty, swiftly turning him into one of the most effective cultural operators of Futurismo in the post-war years. In fact, for many critics, Giovanni Lista in particular, the extent and the influence of Rampolini's uh, networking and, culture, and activities in cultural promotion and uh, organization constitute his true legacy above and beyond his creative work. So, According to many, Rampolini is best remembered as a cultural operator rather than a scenographer, which he was, a visual artist, which he also was, a film, you know, someone who was engaged and interested in early film, which he also was. But first and foremost, a cultural operator. Through his editorial work, Rampolini's collaborations radiated out to include significant reviews, and I've put um, on the slide some of the reviews that Trampolini's had uh, uh, sort of active engagement with, from the Sturm to, um, to the Stiel, Hetovizigt, and Les Prémonville. In the 1930s, the network also included Cercle Carré and the anti-surrealist association Abstraction Création, as I've already mentioned. A complex network of personal contacts gave Grampolini access to the latest trends, allowing him to navigate them confidently, stimulating in turn self-reflection and revision of his own practice. And now we come to his uh, journal, Nomi, which of course means we or us. It was the title of the periodical Prampolini founded in 1917. Um, and I'm going to come in a moment at, at this sort of incredible convergence, of course, with Portugal Futurista mm -hmm. <laughs> in 1917, which um, I believe is a field that really ought maybe to be explored a bit more because I haven't been able to find any specific connections, but I'm sure there must have been because. As you will see, some of the collaborators are the same. Okay, so um, in 1917, uh, Prampolini founded Noi together with the Florentine aristocrat Bino Saminiatelli. Of course, Saminiatelli <coughs> provided the funding for you know, for, for this um, venture. Noi quickly became the hub and engine of this rich transnational network that Prampolini was already um, nurturing. The title Noi was, of course, a neo-collectivist reference to humanitarian socialism and the democratic arts and craft movement. Saminiatelli provided financial backing and edited the first three issues of the journal, which came out in June 1917, February 1918, and January 1919, respectively. What happens here, and I'm sure it's a practice across all modernist journals across Europe, is that several issues were conflated together. So only um, three hard copies came out, one you know, each year from 1917, 1918, 1919, but they conflated together three issues, uh, each, each one of them. San Miniatelli further helped disseminate the journal 
through his association with Dada. In 1920, however, Samignatelli left sole responsibility to Brampolini in order to pursue his own writing career. So Brampolini became the sole and only editor. Now, the year 1917, when Noi came to light, was momentous. Rampolini, uh, at this stage, was in Rome, uh, where he met with Cocteau and Picasso, who had followed the Aguilev for the experience of the Ballet Russe in Rome. Rampolini discussed with Picasso the new orientation of the avant-garde. Picasso complimented his work, which was be beginning to become better known and to sell to savvy buyers, and we glean this from correspondence with uh, Francesco Fratello. Noi rapidly established a reputation as one of the most significant international reviews of the time. And quoting from Bernardino Sani, it was a mirror of problems, possibilities and contradictions inherent in the Italian avant-garde within a larger European framework. Now, as far as Portugal Futuris is concerned, I would really like to hear from you. Like I said, I haven't found any evidence of, um, of sort of direct and specific connections, but I'm pretty sure there must have been uh, at least two key people who were collaborators of Noi were also collaborators of Portugal Futurista, Blaise Sandra and Apollinaire before he died. Um, and so, I, I, you know, I, I don't know whether this is the, the right time to discuss this, but it certainly, this certainly is an area where it would be nice to see more research done on the Portuguese connections of, um, of this particular journal because there's no research at all um, on this. Noi drew on a network of correspondents in and outside Italy who exchanged and disseminated new trends. It aimed to reject the petty nationalism of a rival uh, review called L'Italia Futurista, a review which had preceded it, uh, but was very steeped in nationalist in a nationalist agenda. And Noi pushed instead forward a robust international agenda reminiscent of Bragaglia's circle, which was where Campolini had been uh, trained. Noi reflected and propagated ideas in European and extra-European circulation at the time. Its compass was global, including several avant-garde scenes, which would have otherwise, at least in Italy, remained very little known. For instance, what, there was a, a very important Japanese branch uh, of interest to the journal, and um, the Japanese futurist poet Tai Kambara and the painter Yoshimitsu Nagano were featured prominently in um, in the magazine, in the journal. Now, I don't have many um, examples of, um, of Brampolini's autographs and, and correspondence, so this is really one of the few things I could find. Um, but I thought I, I, would, uh, um, I would include them here, because it just goes to show, the, um, in, to a small degree, but the breadth and latitude of Prampolini's networks. In a postcard to Bino Samignatelli dated 12th of August 1917, Prampolini enumerates, enumerates his correspondence. They include Reverti, Biro, Cocteau, Picasso, Folgore, Moscatelli, Apollinaire, Max Jacob, Soffici, and many, many others. So it, it really is, you know, again, it would be nice to know what contacts he had in Portugal, because I'm sure he did. And this is something that I need your help, I need your help with. Encouragements, compliments and promises to contribute testify to the dynamism and vitality of this network. Reviews of French, English, American and Spanish art and literature were commissioned locally. The French section was to be edited by Apollinaire, but of course, uh, due to Apollinaire's death, on 8 November 1918, it was then assigned instead to Blaise Sandra. 
Arnudo del Re edited the UK section, Wallace the American one, and Perez Corva the Spanish edition. So far as I know, there wasn't a Portuguese edition or a Portuguese correspondent, but that may well be. Noy published articles in the original language, especially English and French, to maximize its reach. In a letter to San Miniaterbi, dated 1918 or 1919, Rampolini situates Noy firmly at the center of the poetics of machine art. The journal published theoretical statements, drafted a chronology of machine aesthetics, republished Panaggi and Paladini's Manifesto of Mechanical Art, and propagated Gleiser's and Leger's constructivist pronouncements. Coming out as a single issue in February 1918, Issues number two, three, and four included Gino Severini's essay in Machinismo e l'arte, originally brought out in Mercure de France in April 1916. In this article, Severini argued that the widespread awe for locomotives had been superseded in the 20th century by a new realism, precipitated by the machine's precision rhythm and brutality, I'm quoting here from Severini's article. Prampolini designed the covers of issues number 5, 6 and 7, which came out in January 1919, with mechanical illustrations by Carra, Severini, Savinio, De Chirico and Archipenko. So this is the end of the first series of Noi, which folded for financial reasons like often happens to, to these enterprises, um, to the modernist uh, uh, enterprises. And so, nine issues came out, but physically there were only three, three uh, magazines published. There was a second series um, that came out, that started coming out in April 1923, and issue number two, published in May 1923, opened with a manifesto of mechanic art undersigned by Crampolini, Pannacci and Palladini, dated October 1922. And it's of course, you know, the 1922 is, like we said, the, the year, the annus mirabilis of mechanical theatre and of, of, of the machine across, across Europe. Subject to re-elaboration and clarification penned by Palladini, who re-emphasized a militant social epistemology of machines, this manifesto circulated in Europe, becoming widely influential. Um, again, there was some disagreement between Grampolini and Palladini. Palladini was one of those uh, Italian futurists who had um, um, very strong communist loyalties, and he had uh, uh, in fact, worked for long periods of time in Moscow. He was himself half Russian, and his loyalty was absolutely constructivist. Um, Rampolini was beginning to drift in the sort of early to mid 1920s towards a sort of more spiritual, um, you know, sort of quoted, quoting him, spiritual. Um, attachment or investment in the machine. So there were disagreements about this particular manifesto or approach to the machine, but it was published in the second series of Noi. And in spite of Marinetti's nationalist declarations in the first issue, the profile of Noi remained unaltered, especially as far as its focus on the European avant-garde was concerned. Its contributions continue to be quoted in the original language and be very transnational in, in, in their uh, focus. On 7th of April 1924, in personal correspondence with the Polish poet Kurek, Rampolini mentioned the imminent publication of a special issue of Noi on international avant-garde scenography. Printed on the back cover of this issue in graphic layout, prominently displayed in block lettering. Um, you can see here that I've also um, highlighted this um, here. You can see the broad spectrum of some of the titles of the prominent contemporary periodicals that um, were correspondents and were 
uh, collaborating with, with NOI at this stage. Mm -hmm. While making explicit its international connections, this table is vis visually striking, highlighting Prampolini's febrile cross-disciplinary activities you know, across national borders. The issues number 10, 11, and 12 opened with the 1923 Manifesto L'Art Mécanique, signed Le Peintre Futuriste Italien. The focus was also on the Exposition Internationale des Arts Décoratifs, the very famous Expo of Paris of 1925, and Mechanical Theatre. And at this Expo, Rampolini actually won a very important prize for his project called uh, Magnetic Theatre. So it was a very important experience in Prampolini's um, activities. The indefatigable Prampolini had long since promoted his own Casa d'Arte in Rome, art house in Rome. This was a permanent collection and club open to professionals and intellectuals, a venue for debates, exhibitions and readings. Prampolini launched the Casa d'Arte in 1919 with the specific remit to regenerate the de decorative arts. The interior was unpolished, the furniture was slim and elegant, triangular and dynamic. Relocating to a permanent exhibition space in Via Francesco Crispi in 1920, a building on two floors including a theatre, a reading room, bookshop and tea room accessible to both members and the general public, the Casa d'Arte flourished, but for a very short period of time. Again, financial difficulties uh, get in the way. The new premises were inaugurated by Marinetti on 18th of February, and its ambitious, if only partially realized, program included a long list of shows exhibiting works by Braque, Gleis, Leger, Laurent, Metzinger, Picasso, Severini, The Vorticist, Dada, The Belgian Avant-Garde, and Der Sturm. The Casa was a further landmark of Grampolini's international activities, building on his expertise as cultural promoter, paving the way for future connections and initiatives. The experience, however, folded in 1921 due to financial penury. Following a reorientation towards Eastern Europe in the attempt to rehouse Futurismo closer to the revolution, Rampolini left for Prague in the same year, where he sought collaboration with the journals Stavba, Tisk and Horizont. In Prague, Rampolini penetrated new intellectual circles and knitted together new contacts and crossovers. So basically in the early 1920s, you see Prampolini as a sort of pawn in a chess. I see him as a sort of pawn in a, in a game of chess across Rome, Prague, and Paris, Berlin, and Dusseldorf, so moving you know, all the time. Prampolini's multiple enterprises and migratory drifts across Europe were mired by financial and logistic difficulties. I'm sort of moving, I'm jumping ahead quite a lot now. In a letter to Marinetti, uh, dated of autumn 1943, Prampolini confided, and I quote, I'm telling you I'm thoroughly disgusted, not to put it more strongly. I'm afraid there is little for art and for us futurists to do, in spite of my indefatigable goodwill, end of quote. Now Marinetti, of course, was reaching his own death. Marinetti died in 1944. But Prampolini was still active and he was ready to meet his next challenge, a new form of dialogue and exchange, which he called L'Art Club, the Art Club. Joining the reconstruction, this is sort of post-Second World War, um, so the Art Club is, is sort of part of the reconstruction effort of, of Rome in the, in the, uh, after the Second World War. It was a sort of avatar of his previous defunct art house. Art Club called upon all artists working in Rome to gather together. This was to be an independent forum oriented towards new international trends. L'Art Club mounted shows, auctions, 
open air ballroom dancing, contributing to the debate on contemporary art through an eponymous newsletter. The club rapidly became a magnet for young artists attracted by the transnational connections of the artists that they met there, you know, people like Prampolini and Severini, who were both involved in our club, would have seemed to a new generation of post-war artists as, you know, the emblems of the 1920s, you know, sort of international clique of the international group. So both Severini and Prampolini mentored young artists in post-war Rome in mastering the so-called international style the sort of 1920s style. And this is, I mean, a, a, an incredible enterprise, if you think about it, in a ravaged Rome, in the post-war, think of Rome open city, you know, a sort of devastated, ruinous city. Um, and we almost picture Brampolini walking the dusty streets of Rome, of post-war Rome. He stands alone, working assiduously, organizing exhibitions, initiating projects, and gathering forces together, still in the name of Futurismo, you know, whatever that meant or how different that would have been from, you know, the Futurismo of the heyday, against the tide of inevitable dissolution and dispersal of the group. Trampolini's agenda remained networked and international right to the very end. His physical health progressively deteriorated and he was forced to spend long, frustrating periods of rest and inactivity. In a two-page letter to Marinetti's widow, Benedetta, who was also an artist and a fellow futurist, dated 29th of October 1955, Rampolini requested paintings and sculptures to be exhibited in six major Australian cities. The letter also betrays Rampolini's nervous exhaustion, a prelude to his impending death. Rampolini's creative genius was acknowledged only in 1956, after his death, posthumously, with a gold medal awarded by the Italian president in recognition of his merits in the artistic field. And I'm going to stop here and uh, invite your comments and uh, observations, especially as far as concerns the connections with Portugal, which like I said, I haven't been able to locate, but it would be so interesting for me to um, to discover. Thank you very much, Katya.